Good evening, guys. Um, uh, I know usually we try and meet in person, um, and there was a little bit of confusion about tonight, um, and so I hope it wasn't too confusing. Uh, but uh, so we we didn't meet uh, in person uh, this week. Uh, however, here's kind of the recording that would have of what I would have talked about. Um, in person, uh, so I hope uh, if you have any questions, feel free to email me. Uh, but as we have been doing, uh, we're going to have a great, um, and uh, we kind of mentioned uh, this great before, uh, but this is King Cyrus uh, the Great, uh, or some may call him Emperor Cyprus, not Cyprus, Cyrus. Uh, because he was the emperor of the Persian Empire. Uh, and we uh, we know a little bit about him in the Bible. Uh, we know that uh, to the Jews, uh, especially uh, those who are coming back in Ezra and Nehemiah, he is more of a mess- messianic figure um, than uh, maybe he was uh, coming out of some of the prophets. Uh, However, uh, what he did was he forged Persia into a great empire uh, and built up its power on the world stage enough to rival the Babylonians and the Assyrians uh, uh, in which he conquered them. And then he was strong enough that uh, he, uh, he intimidated the Egyptians um, and the Greeks for a while. Um, until Alexander the Great in Greece uh, comes in and defeats him. Or he doesn't defeat Cyrus. He defeats the Persians. Uh, But that's a different discussion. Uh, Cyrus was uh, recognized as something greater uh, than just a strong military leader uh, because uh, out of those who he conquered, uh, of those he liberated, uh, of those he led, uh, he seemed to have a supernatural success uh, on a- all of his campaigns. Uh, this earned him titles such as King of Kings, the Great King, uh, the King of the Four Corners of the World, the King of the Universe, and as I already mentioned, Messiah. Um, quick note, it, I said he was given the title King of Kings. Uh, he was. Uh, it's not the title uh, that we are familiar with referring to uh, the Jewish uh, Messiah, who is also this greater uh, Gentile Messiah that we know as Christ. Uh, however, uh, the Babylonians uh, had a sect that he liberated, uh, and that sect um, labeled him King of Kings, um, or uh, probably more literally, Emperor of Emperors. Um, and so... Uh, we see that this Cyrus had this air around him, that he had something special about him. Uh, he could order anyone to their death um, or uh, anyone uh, to uh, do anything he wished. Uh, it, you weren't going to tell Cyrus no. Um, yet, uh, all this power and authority he had over the nation of uh, Persia and of uh, the militaries and the nations. Um, he was still uh, under the powers of sin, uh, death, uh, storms, illnesses, um, and all the other powers. He dies in battle. um, And part of this, because he's weakened by an illness, he gets during a storm. uh, And so he he has all the power and authority in the world, but he can't stop. uh, uh, He can't stop uh, the... Uh, I guess, forces of nature is what we would call them today. Um, however, this week we'll see that Jesus is not under these powers and instead is over them and it exhibits great control over them uh, in several uh, points in the passage. Uh, we have a few guiding questions this week, um, or maybe it's just the one. Uh, what is significant about Jesus executing authority over the storm, the demons, and death? Uh, so as we go through these uh, stories in Luke 8, uh, 
starting in verse 22 and going through the end of the chapter, uh, let's have that question kind of on our mind as we proceed. The first story we get to is uh, Jesus calms a storm, uh, which is in verse 22 uh, through 25, and I'll read that. Uh, One day uh, he got on a boat with his disciples and said to them, let us go across to the other side of the lake. So they set out, and they sailed, and he fell asleep. And a windstorm came down on the lake, and they were filling with water and were in danger. And they went and woke him, saying, Master, Master, we are perishing. And he awoke and rebuked the wind and the raging waves, and they ceased. There was a calm. He said to them, Where is your faith? And they were afraid, and they marveled, saying to one another, Who is this, that he commands even the winds and the water, and they obey him? A few notes, uh, and we kind of talked about this earlier. Uh, Luke calls it, uh, or Luke calls the Sea of Galilee uh, a lake, uh, which we mentioned is because the Greek name, uh, or the name in Greek, is the Lake of Gennesaret, uh, which is true. Um, It's not, it's all referring to the same thing. Um, It's not one's more correct than the other. It's just, uh, really has to do with which language, I guess, you're more familiar with. Um, and then so Luke continues to refer to the Sea of Galilee by this name. Uh, and if we were to really think about it, um, it should be more properly called a lake uh, than a sea. Uh, a lot of the things we call seas in the United States, uh, not seas, lakes in the United States, uh, <laughs> uh are huge compared to the Sea of Galilee. Um, I guess in Texas alone, there are about six other lakes that are larger uh, than the Sea of Galilee. Um, The one I found most uh, comparable in size uh, to the Sea of Galilee was the Richland Chambers Reservoir, uh, which is uh, southeast of Corsicana. Um, I haven't been there personally. Um, I'm just looking at a map and... uh, comparing uh, surface area to surface area. Um, So it's about that size. Um, You can stand there and you can see kind of where you're already going, Um, but that doesn't mean it doesn't take you a while to cross. Um, And so Jesus falls asleep as they're going across and a storm comes and causes the disciples to wake up in a panic. Uh, I, I included this picture here. And I kind of enjoyed kind of the imagery here because it's uh, a much more violent uh, looking storm uh, than I think sometimes we're used to uh, seeing. Uh, and it's probably more of a uh, more realistic of a depiction of uh, showing a violent storm on a lake. Um, and so what we see is uh, here and what we see in uh, Luke is because everything around them is going on, the storm is roaring. Uh, we have water going everywhere. The wind is kicking up waves and water is entering the boat. The disciples panic. Uh, they, they start to lose faith, um, which is understandable. Um, but it also is, uh, is one of those things that logically it makes all sense that, of course, Jesus isn't going to let them drown. Especially if he's asleep, uh, Jesus is all powerful, um, and yet we're sitting here, and the disciples are losing faith. And I think part of that, and what we see even in human nature today, is when the storm starts roaring, all logic, all whole reasoning, uh, goes out the window. We also see Jesus questions his disciples' faith. Uh, before rebuking the storm, silence and silencing the seas. This is significant, uh, I guess, this idea of him rebuking uh, the seas and the winds, uh, because we, what we see in Greek and Roman and Canaanite and Babylonian, Egyptian, Persian, um, basically anyone who had a pantheon of gods at the time, uh, there were at least two, if not more, 
different deities that would be over a storm. Uh, most notably in the Old Testament is Baal. Uh, Baal was a storm god. He was a weather god. And so there's a little bit of this here of Jesus has the authority over those gods, uh, over those uh, deities who others might attribute uh, having that power over. But what we also see is it's kind of a a reaffirming of Jesus as the son of Yahweh, um, as someone who, a God that we know is all powerful. He's the creator. He's over the storms. He's over the skies. Um, nothing is without him. And so he is not just a son of Zeus or a son of Jupiter, uh, but rather he is a son of Yahweh, the all powerful, the almighty. Um, and I included two questions, uh, for this section. You may want to use them. You may not. Uh, the first question is, how would you respond if you were stuck out on the water in the middle of the storm? The next is, what other significance is there that Jesus has authority and power over the storms? And so those are just a few things I want us to kind of consider and talk about uh, in this section. Uh, the next one we get is kind of describing uh, this man with a demon. And I'll read it, read the passage, and I'll explain uh, kind of what we know and what we don't know. Um, starting in verse 26. Then they sailed to the country of the Gerasenes, which is opposite of Galilee. When Jesus had stepped out on land, there met him a man from the city who has had demons. For a long time he had worn no clothes, but he had not lived in a house, but among the tombs. When he saw Jesus, he cried out and fell down before him and said with a loud voice, What have you to do with me, Jesus, son of the most high God? I beg you, do not torment me. For he had command the unclean spirit to come out of the man. For many a time it had seized him. He was kept under guard and bound with chains and shackles. But he would break the bonds and be driven by the demon into the desert. Jesus then asked him, what is your name? And he said, Legion. For many demons had entered him, and they had begged him not to command them to depart into the abyss. Now a large herd, herd of pigs was feeding there on a hillside, and they begged him to let him enter those. So he gave them permission, and the demons came out of the man and entered the pigs and rushed down the steep bank into the lake and drowned. When the herdsmen saw what had happened, they fled and told it in the city and in the country. Then people went out to see what had happened. And they came to Jesus and found the man from whom the demons had gone. And he was sitting at the feet of Jesus, clothed in in his right mind, and they were afraid. And those who had seen it had told how the demon-possessed man had been healed. Then all the people surrounding the city of the Gerasenes asked him to depart from them. For they were seized with great fear. So they got into the boat and returned. The man from whom the demons had gone begged that he might be with them. But Jesus sent him away, saying, Return to your home, and declare how much God has done for you. And he went away, proclaiming throughout the whole city how much Jesus had done for him. All right, so in this section, uh, we don't really know where the... Uh, the country of the Gerasenes is. Uh, what we do know uh, is it's on the other side of of the Galilee, uh, not of the Galilee of Galilee, um, and so um, that kind of leaves us in a general area um, on the southwest, uh, not southwest, southeastern coast of uh, the Sea of Galilee, um, and it could be anywhere from uh, somewhere in uh, the Decapolis. Uh, which is Roman controlled or uh, the territory of the Tetrarch of Philip. That is uh, Philip Herod II. Uh, and it's important to note uh, this because uh, these are not necessarily all Gentile areas, but there's a, there would be a noticeable uptick of Gentiles um, from Galilee uh, to this other side where, it's either the Diacopolis or uh, the Tetrarch of Philip's territory. 
Um, and what we see uh, here is Jesus and his disciples are there and it's not Galilee anymore. Um, there's a few things uh, that kind of stick out um, and we'll touch on those, uh, but there's a clear shift. Um, I, I, I want to brag on myself real quick. Uh, I really enjoyed this slide because I made it myself. Um, and it's kind of a play on the Wizard of Oz. Uh, you can keep it in there. You cannot. Um, it doesn't matter to me. Um, I'll just, uh, I just wanted to kind of brag because I, I still crack up looking at it. Um, anyway, um, what we see is this noticeably Gentile area. And he comes upon this man. And the first person he sees in this area, uh, as Luke tells it, is this uh, probably a Gentile um, who is cursed with demons. Uh, I know my version says demon, uh, and some of the translations make it sound like it's just one. Uh, but then it also kind of contradicts itself and says uh, many demons had entered him. Uh, I don't think it's a really big uh, difference, uh, whether it's we say demon or demon. Or, demons uh because he is still cured uh, and healed in a remarkable way uh what we see is uh legion uh, who's cast out of this man uh, who's been uh i guess causing seizures uh who's seized full control of this man uh they are begging christ not to use his power over them uh, and he's begging them not to send them back uh, to the pit, to Sheol, to hell, uh, however we want to imagine this. But the idea here is they would rather be driven into unclean clean animals uh, like pigs, uh, which is another sign of this being a, a Gentile area because uh, Jews were not allowed to eat pork. Uh, but so these demons are driven into pigs. And they rush down a slope and go into the sea and to drown. Um, so what we see is even the demons don't necessarily want to be demons, um, or at least they don't want to be demons who failed. Uh, and so uh, that raises a whole other slew of questions. Um, but what we really want to be focusing on is the importance of it being multiple demons kind of also goes to lend Jesus is doing something special here. Uh, we we know from uh, reports and acts and other points in the gospel where it kind of implies it, but there's uh, magicians or there's some other false prophets who are kind of casting out demon uh, or will cast out a demon from a woman um, and not necessarily multiple demons. Uh, and what we see is, however, here is Christ casts out a legion of demons, uh, whether that is just there's a multiple, uh, that's a reference to the multiplicity of the demons, or it's really referring to a legion, uh, which is a, uh, I, I'm, I'm suddenly blanking on the amount of uh, soldiers that is, uh, but it would be, it's it's a very large group and they have been sent with a purpose uh, to seize this man. But we see here is Christ barely seems to bat an eye and cast out this legion of demons into these pigs. Um, and he does something that even the disciples and the apostles uh, seem to struggle with, um, as we'll see later on in the gospel accounts of they struggle to cast out demons on, I believe the second time they're sent out uh, because th one, that's a whole nother sermon that of they've lost sight of who gave them the power and that power is from Christ, but they struggle to use it themselves to cast out m multiple demons uh, based on their own personal will. Um, whereas here we're seeing it's only through Christ's power that this is really accomplished. And then I included two uh, questions here as well. Uh, the first being, because the demons being driven out into pigs, uh, many in this region became too afraid uh, to listen or to have Christ in their presence. Do we ever do the same thing when we become frightened? 
And I'll make a note about this question. I kind of struggled on whether to include it or not. I think it's a good question for us to kind of at least consider as teachers because here Jesus is probably about to start his next stage of ministry. He comes to a new region. He performs a miracle. He executes his authority over the powers of sin, at least. And the people become afraid and they tell him, please leave. We we aren't ready to hear this. Please leave. We, we don't want you messing up our, our, our status quo. And I think sometimes we, especially in the modern church in America, what we sometimes run into those obstacles, uh, whether it's, no, 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 no. We're not ready to do this ministry or that ministry, or uh, we don't really want to talk about this or that or whatever. And so that's kind of a difficulty that we run into. The second question I included was, what is the significance of Jesus crossing the Sea of Galilee, healing one man and then leaving? And I guess that's second, a twofold of what is. What do you think it mean, meant to that man? For that demon-possessed man, he he's the first person to come see Jesus once he and his disciples get onto the, the shore. He's healed. People have brought a crowd, and the crowd asks him, a crowd asks Jesus, go away, please. Please go away. And Jesus does. And this man, he wants to go with them, but he's told, no, you have to do ministry here. I think that's significant. One, to be chosen to do ministry by Christ. But also, it's significant for that one person, that one man, because everything he knows has kind of been flipped on his head. Because Christ came to him to be healed, or for him to be healed. And so there has to be some significance to that as well. We'll go ahead and move on. Uh, the next verses uh, would be 40 through 56. This is kind of a twofold story. Uh, they're, they're kind of squished together. Uh, and I'll go ahead and read the whole bit, and then we'll uh, kind of break it back down. Now, when Jesus returned, the crowd had welcomed him, for they were all waiting for him. And there came a man named Jairus, who was a ruler of the synagogue, and falling at Jesus' feet, he implored him to come to his house, for he had only an only daughter, about twelve years of age, and was dying. As Jesus went, the people pressed him round him, and there was a woman who had not a discharge of blood for twelve years. And though she had spent all her living on physicians, she could not be healed by anyone. She came up behind him and touched the fringe of his garment. And immediately her discharge of blood ceased. And Jesus said, Who was it that touched me? When all denied it, Peter said, Master, the crowd surround you and are pressing in on you. But Jesus said, Someone has touched me, for I perceive that the power has gone out from me. And when the woman saw that she was not hidden, she came trembling and falling down before him, declared in the presence of all people why she had touched him. And she had been immediately healed. And he said to her, Daughter, your faith has made you well. Go in peace. While he was still speaking, someone from the ruler's house came and said, Your daughter has already died. Do not trouble the teacher anymore. But Jesus, on hearing this, answered him, Do not fear, only believe. She will be well. And when he came to the house, he allowed no one to enter except Peter, John, and James, and the father and the mother of the child. And all were weeping and mourning for her. But he said, Do not weep, for she is not dead, but she is sleeping. And they all laughed at him, knowing that she was, in fact, dead. But taking her by the hand, he called, saying, Child, arise. And her spirit returned, and she got up at once, and he directed that something should be given to her to eat. And her parents were amazed, and he charged them to tell no one of what had happened. There's a few things uh, to mention here. Uh, Jesus comes back to Galilee, um, and he's already having a crowd kind of gathered before him. 
I kind of think it would be funny to imagine Christ is on a boat with his disciples and they're coming in and someone's like an hour and a half ago noticed that the boat was headed back to Galilee uh, looking through a mag not a magnifying glass, a telescope or I guess uh, some sort of uh, monitoring of the sea and he he's rushes down and spreads the news that Jesus is coming. And so everyone rushes to the port to see him as soon as he gets off, which is almost a polar opposite of what happened uh, on the other side of the sea where only one demon possessed man came before him. And notably Jairus comes and is waiting there and is begging Christ uh, to come to his house to heal his daughter. And Jairus is a man of uh, note. Uh, he is a he's the leader of the synagogue. Uh, he wouldn't have led a service uh, per se. Uh, he probably could be best compared to an administrative minister. Uh, so imagine kind of what Dewey is has started to phase into. Uh, he's in charge of making sure. Uh, I guess if we're modernizing the context making sure worship schedules are turned in, uh, different uh, writings are all put together, no one's fallen behind, uh, whatever resources someone needs, they get turned in. Uh, so in that context, it's uh, we make sure we have enough resources for the synagogue, we have enough uh, papyrus, ink, uh, quills, uh, the ministers have what they, I guess they're not called ministers, the rabbis, and the Pharisees and the Sadducees, whoever would use the synagogue, everything's where it is. All the materials are well taken care of. Uh, so you kind of get the idea. And I don't necessarily like this picture as much uh, to the, kind of describe this movement in, toward, in ta into town uh, towards Jairus' house. Uh, because I always, this is one of those uh, imagination moments, kind of paints a picture that, at least for me, uh, hasn't been painted yet. Uh, and so the idea is they are so crowded uh, around Jesus that everyone's touching him. Uh, I'm sure Peter is right there. And uh, if we're to believe uh, some of the uh, of what the chosen chooses to depict, uh, Matthew is probably very overwhelmed as everyone's touching him uh, as uh, – uh, and so what we see is like this crowd and the disciples and the apostles are just trying to like push their way through and they're trying to help Jesus get to Jairus's house as soon as they can. Uh, and just as everyone else is kind of working against them, reaching over, trying to grab at Jesus, grab his attention, grab his clothes, whatever. And here we see a woman who's been bleeding for 12 years. Uh, this would have most likely uh, been a more of a menstrual bleeding. Uh, it's kind of something that is implied throughout, if we were to read between the lines, uh, just because the Greeks didn't really have a huge, uh, I guess, distinction uh, for which language to use. Uh, but she, she would have been a bleeding menstrually, uh, for 12 years, uh, meaning she was unclean the entire time uh, because due to the law, a woman is to wait until her uh, menstruation had stopped uh, and all bleeding had stopped uh, and then wait two weeks before being deemed clean again, uh, which seems uh, like a very difficult process. Um, however, um, what we see here is this woman hasn't stopped bleeding for 12 years and she has gone to every doctor and she has emptied her bank account. Basically she has no wealth. She is probably um, as close to homeless as one could possibly get. Um, if not being homeless, uh, we don't know if she was supported by a family member or something, uh, but she is probably weak uh, or weakened because of this. And she has pushed her way through, and somehow she has gone so close um, to Jesus, where either she has fallen down or whatever. But she's 
she reaches her hand out and she grabs uh, the hem 